Welcome everybody to this uh, research seminar from the Institute uh, of Future Studies. Uh, we again have this hybrid seminar, so we have an audience here and an audience online. And uh, uh, I'm very happy uh, to have Jason Sarneski here. Uh, he is uh, uh, currently uh, Olof Palme visiting professor here in, uh, in uh, Sweden. And otherwise, he is at, uh, a professor at uh, uh, Pace University in New York. He has a, uh, a JD from uh, Chicago uh, Law School and a PhD in European Union Environmental Law and Procurement Law uh, from Uppsala. And uh, today he will talk about linking environmental law, climate justice and global security. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you everyone for attending, both in person and online, and thank you everyone at the Institute for Future Studies. Uh, this is the first time I've given a live lecture while standing wearing a sport coat in nine months, uh, so we will see how it goes. So thank you all uh, for coming. Uh, as most of you know, uh, Olaf Palme was former prime minister of, of Sweden and arguably Sweden's most well-known politician, though not without controversy, and he said, uh, I should go back to the original side. And he said, our countryside and environment are being exposed to strains, changes, and degradation that may also ultimately threaten peace directly or indirectly in many regions. And so Pome uh, fought for workers' rights, the decolonization of the developing world, social welfare and public health, women's rights, championed a movement away from fossil fuels, and even opposed apartheid. But Peace was his most important task, uh, said his successor, Ingvar Carlsen. Peace, security, well-being depend on achieving the three pillars of sustainability, environmental, social, and economic welfare, all items championed by Palme. Um, I'm fortunate enough to hold the Olaf Palm professorship at Stockholm University, um, and today I want to talk about this link between the environment climate as it relates to justice and global security. Uh, a topic I've intentionally made broad uh, and I hope can lead to fruitful discussion because I understand everyone listening today comes from a variety of different disciplines. One thesis of my talk is that society must recognize that climate change as well as the current global pandemic are both sustainability and security crises. The three dimensions of environmental, social, and economic welfare are not only the key pillars of sustainable development, but also the key factors for security. And we see significant law, social, and policy challenges in accounting for the large scale disruptions due to climate change. Things like mass migration, food insecurity, natural disasters, access to clean water, inequality, and the general breakdown of civil society, right? People might call that social trust here in, in Sweden. Uh, but let's start with some art. Um, this is a close-up of my favorite piece of art. Uh, it's Untitled by Cy Twombly, located in the Milwaukee Art Museum, uh, where I grew up in the United States. Milwaukee is about uh, 90 miles 90 American miles, an hour and a half north of Chicago. And uh, most people see this and they see a chalkboard, uh, but this is not a chalkboard. It's a white canvas uh, painted with black and white paint. And I show this uh, because we can't simply erase the marks that we've already created in our environment. We must deal with our challenges against an existing backdrop which may last for quite a long time. We must deal with our climate reality. And one of my goals this year and in this lecture is to raise awareness about sustainability and global security and connect different academic disciplines to achieve this goal, whether it's my discipline of law or perhaps art. My charge of the Olaf Palme professorship is to broaden our understanding of peace and welfare, to include ecological resiliency in the Anthropocene, arguing that we cannot have global security 
without a healthy environment. And I have three specific goals for today's lecture. First, to illustrate the link between environmental protection and global peace and security. Two, suggest how we might account for this link. What is the role of law? What is our role as individuals? And how can different disciplines, whether science, law, or art, be involved? Finally, perhaps we can brainstorm what insights we can learn from the current coronavirus pandemic. For example, are there social justice links between climate change and COVID-19? So the first thing we need to do is I need to prove there is a link between climate change and global security. Well, if Donald Trump thinks there is, then I think we all can too. Uh, this is from the Defense Authorization Act of, of 2017. It's the sense of Congress that climate change is a direct threat to national security of the United States. Every year since Donald Trump has taken office, Congress has passed this climate legislation as part of the defense spending bill, and Trump has signed all of those into law. Some people have questioned whether or not there is a direct link. Um, I think this requirement that we show some sort of linearity, direct causation, um, you know, is not necessarily, but there is a link. And you know, one argument is that Greta Thunberg hasn't won the Nobel Prize yet because she's unable to show there's such a strong link between peace and climate change. Taking a step back, uh, I've been excited to do this work in Stockholm. And uh, because I've had the opportunity to deal with so many diff different disciplines, the dif Swedish Defense University, the Stockholm Resiliency Center, uh, art galleries like Accelerator, and now here at the Institute for Future Studies. And Sweden has long been at the forefront of recognizing the link between environmental protection and social welfare. Uh, the Declaration of the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment was adopted in Stockholm in June of 1972. We're approaching its anniversary. And it recognized that natural resources must be safeguarded. Earth's capacity to produce renewable resources must be maintained. Non-renewable resources must be shared and not exhausted. And pollution must not exceed the environment's capacity to clean itself. Swedish environmental law scholars have since started to draw the link between environmental and natural resources protection and global social security. Uh, it's what Jonas Ebbinson at Stockholm University calls social ecological security. In his 2014 article entitled Social Ecological C Security and International Law in the Anthropocene, he notes, the notion of security has changed significantly in international context since the Stockholm Convention so as to include social ecological concerns even at a global scale. He notes that there's not a single reference to security in the Stockholm Convention, but this has changed. By 1992, the Rio Declaration stated peace, development, and environmental protection are independent and indivisible, or sorry, interdependent and in indivisible. And the UN Human Rights Council in 2010 said the environment is a crucial aspect of the right to peace. An area of particular relevance is climate change. So we've seen a growth in the international community of understanding this linkage. This is Kenyan activist Wangari Maathai, receiving the 2004 Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo uh, in 24, 2004, which I just said, of course. <laughs> her good works and her planting of trees is really the foundation of today's talk. Uh, I relied on her work in uh, receiving uh, the grant to do this research, and so I thank her uh, for that, even though she is now deceased. And in her lecture, she recognized that in order to, quote, reduce conflicts and poverty and therefore improve quality of life, unquote, society must, quote, protect our environment. She thanked the Nobel Committee for having placed the critical issue of the environment and its linkage to democracy and peace before the world. In other words, she recognized the relationship between environmental protection and peace, and anyone doing this type of work stands on her shoulders. I have three thoughts 
about her powerful meshes, measure, uh, sorry, message. First, first, due to the massive and significant harms resulting from climate change and the clear link between environmental protection and global peace and security, we need to raise awareness that this link is real. It's important, it's vast. Second, the three pillars of sustainability, environmental, social, and economic welfare, define peace. They define security. It's how we would define our own sustainability, that we have a healthy environment, that we have economic welfare, and that we're happy in our social environment. And finally, it raises a question of whether this problem is even solvable in the current dominance of our consumption economy, cost-benefit analysis, and neoliberal regulation that has permeated our societies. Perhaps we need mass global activism or economic support for local communities. Do we need a fundamental shift in the way we live our lives and in the way we handle our business. Others are conveying this message as well. Her Friday strikes for climate have raised, uh, raised alarm and been in the news all over the world. But what is the problem that we're talking about? What is the harm? What is the threat to global security? Why is Greta striking? Uh, well, the global annual mean surface air temperature has been increasing dramatically 18 of the 19 warmest years on record have occurred since the year 2000. And however we display it via this graph or this bucket, we are using up all of our carbon budget. And so as a result, we're facing significant economic, social, and environmental challenge which are putting great strains upon global welfare. The New York Times has recently written about the great climate migration focusing in Central America. We've suffered the Syrian migration, California wildfires, Australian wildfires, Oregon wildfires. And the mass migration in Syria, and this is a picture of displaced people in Syria fleeing violence and walking towards the Syrian border. The mass migration and war in Syria may be the first climate war or climate migration. And so we have a need to recognize that this environmental issue is leading to great social unrest. When a displaced Syrian farmer was asked if this was about drought, she replied, of course, the drought and un unemployment were important in pushing people toward revolution. When the drought happened, we could handle it for two years, and then we said, it's enough. So while life in Syria relied on agriculture and animal herding, the country's drought lasted from 2006 to 2011. This exacerbated water and agricultural insecurity and caused massive agricultural fail failures and livestock mortality. It also caused the migration of 1.5 million Syrians from rural farming areas to the peripheries of urban centers. The country's vulnerability to drought and additional government policies promoting unsustainable agricultural practices and the failure to address the challenges of such a large displaced population helped lead to the start of the Syrian civil war. More than 6.5 million people relocated internally. And in some, said U.S. President Al Gore, from 2006 to 2017, Syria had a climate-related drought that destroyed 60% of their farms and killed 80% of their livestock and drove a half a million, or a million and a half climate refugees into the cities of Syria, where they collided with another million and a half refugees from the Iraq war. We not only see this in Syria, we see this in other countries like Bangladesh, that is dealing with cyclones, storm surges, surges erosion. And at the same time, India is building a 1,000 
500 mile, US mile, barbed wire fence along the Bangladeshi border. Perhaps the most harrowing statistic, the recent estimate is that environmental migrants expected by 2050 range from 150 to 300 million people around the globe. Our climate challenges not only include climate migration, but also food insecurity. Our global food systems create pervasive environmental, social, and health impacts. The scale of land used for the food value chain alone is immense, with 11% of the globe's land being used for crop production and 26 for livestock grazing. This food insecurity and climate vulnerability map shows where strong climate adaptation and mitigation efforts are most needed to prevent the worst impacts of climate change and make people less vulnerable to food insecurity. Not all of our environmental challenges are global. Many are local. This is not a climate-driven problem, but it's a compelling example of how environmental justice concerns uh, can lead to the breakdown of civil society. The Flint water crisis in the United States is a public health crisis that started in 2014 after the drinking water source for the city of Flint, Michigan was changed. In April 2014, Flint changed its water source from treated Detroit water from Lake Huron and the Detroit River, the Great Lakes, to the Flint River. Officials failed to apply corrosion inhibitors to the water and as a result, lead from aging pipes leached into the water supply, leading to elevated levels of a heavy metal neurotoxin exposing over 100,000 residents. It was so bad, in October of 2014, General Motors truck manufacturing assembly plant, where they build the trucks, discontinued use of the Flint tap water because it was corroding engine parts to give you a sense of how bad the water was. We see other challenges in local communities. For example, an affluent Illinois suburb outside the city of Chicago, the risk of cancer from toxic air emissions is only 282 per million. But in a same community in Louisiana, that risk is 1,505 per million. This is a picture from Louisiana. Uh, from a group called Concerned Citizens of St. John in order to fight air pollution in their community after receiving no help from the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Others examples of environmental justice concerns, asthma rates in the Bronx and East River of New York City are 21 times higher than those of the more affluent communities in Manhattan. So we have lots of challenges Lots of inequities as it relates to our environmental and climate problems. And this type of environmental degradation undermines trust in local and state governments. Trust required to keep communities at peace. When are you willing to ask a police officer for help? Are you convinced your government actors will support you in what you need? Now back to climate. It's not all global problems, as I, as I said, but there are other more personal, more local costs of climate change. As we've seen Arctic ice melt, this has led to challenges with local culture and traditions. This is a photo of an Inuit hunter pulling one of his dogs from a crack in the ice. People living in the Arctic are facing Food shortage, because of an abundance of, the abundance of prey species is altered by rising temperature, and the thinning of ice has made it hard for them to move around for hunting. Sometimes the US government has been forced to send frozen fish to Inuit hunters for food. So as the ice melts in the Arctic, they lose important corridors that link different communities for social reasons and commerce, and there are cultural implications to this loss as well. Okay, still continuing on with proving this link 
between environmental harm, climate change, and challenges uh, to global peace and security. It will have severe impacts on public health. This is a woman and child uh, walking in India after severe floods in December of 2015. Uh, the Lancet report on health and climate change uh, has said that extreme heat will impact economic productivity, food supply, uh, lead to increased disease transmission of cholera and dengue fever, um, and is particularly affects vulnerable populations. For example, uh, older populations in the Eastern Mediterranean. Heat stress not only kills people directly, but can lead to kidney, cardiovascular disease, will also reduce labor capacity by diminishing people's ability to work, particularly in the agricultural sector. According to the U.S. National Climate Assessment, extreme rainfalls could overwhelm water systems and sewer systems in the United States, contributing to drinking water shortages and gastrointestinal disease. And in Florida and Texas, higher temperatures will lead to increased mosquitoes to spread viruses like dengue fever, Zika, and yellow fever. Climate change not only affects the global community, our daily lives, but also our personal emotions and well-being. This is a photo of residents watching the Wisley fires burn in the West Hills of the San Fernando Valley uh, in California. Climate change, they're finding, is making peer people irritable, hostile, even violent, according to a study uh, from ISU's Craig uh, Anderson, a psychology professor, and his graduate student. A report from the American Psychological Association and Eco America has says that these extreme weather events are having long-term effects upon our mental health. They can be linked to mild stress and distress and high coping behavior like alcohol use and lead to depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress. Perhaps we're foreshadowing when we talk about the linkages between climate change and the current COVID-19 global pandemic. According to a survey at Yale University, um, our anxiety is rising about climate change. At least 62% of people in the United States are somewhat worried, 21% very worried. And recently, scholars at Kristanstad University here in Sweden and the University of Minnesota in a scoping review article have noted uh, the increased negative effects on mental, emotional, and spiritual health as a result of climate and environmental change. People are particularly concerned about biodiversity, pollution, deforestation, and resource extraction. I feel like I'm painting an extremely gloomy picture. I'll up, uh, we'll, we'll uplift everyone later, but unfortunately, a recent IUCN study has often show, has shown that climate change has lead to gender-based violence as well. The study finds uh, that this is especially problematic for women who are environmental activists, uh, women whose power is being suppressed and undermining their credibility uh, when they speak out uh, in, in protection of their environment. And women walk farther to collect food, water, firewood. This heightens their risk for gender-based violence. For instance, uh, Conflict over scarce resources has led to the practice in Eastern and Southern Africa of sex for fish, where fishermen refuse to sell fish to women who do not engage in sex acts. So what we're seeing is a very serious situation when it comes to climate effects in communities all over the globe. And so to summarize, I think we have a complex system where economic development has led to environmental and climate impacts, which has led to increased conflict, crisis, and emergency. Which leads us to the question of, well, what should we do about this, 
Right? We have all these massive problems. What should we do about this? Do we need a new economic, legal, or governance model to handle these challenges? Right? How do we attack these three pillars of sustainability, which might involve entrepreneurship, social commitment, ecological resiliency, and responsibility? How do we achieve this new model? And there might be many options. We can engage in activism. We could rely on public, international, and domestic environmental law. We could use the courts and seek out litigation. What about private action? What can we do ourselves in our individual behavior and as consumers? What might be other private environmental governance mechanisms, corporate social responsibility, public procurement? And what about the preservation of nature and returning to a conservation ethic? So what about each of these responses? Well, activism is certainly one. Uh, this is me at the Stockholm climate strike, uh, March 15th, 2019. Uh, this picture just seems amazing to me now when I look at all those people uh, <laughs> together. Um, and it forces us to ask, well, what should our role be? What should my role be in raising awareness about the climate crisis? Well, one thing we can do is raise the awareness of other actors. Um, and this is a, a famous photo now as in many of the newspapers, um, the act some of the activists were, were, were cropped out, right? Making us wonder why we, we leave certain communities out of the, the discussion. We could rely upon domestic and international environmental law. One idea would be to, you know, uphold the views of the Paris Agreement, which noted the intrinsic relationship that climate change actions, responses, and impacts have with equitable access to the sustainable development, eradication of poverty, and safeguarding food security and ending hunger. And said so that parties, in paragraph one, that parties should, when taking action to address climate change, they should respect human rights, the right to health, the rights of indigenous people, local communities, migrants, children, persons with disability, and recognize intergenerational equity. We might have domestic legislation, like the Green New Deal. This is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a member of the US Congress. Right? The Green New Deal you know, tries to recognize this link between the economy, transportation, education, housing, with things like clean air, clean water, healthy food. In paragraph four in the congressional bill, it says, whereas climate change, pollution, and environmental discretion have exacerbated systemic, racial, regional, social, environmental, and economic injustices by disproportionately affecting indigenous peoples, communities of color, migrant communities, depopulated rural areas, women, the elderly, the poor, low-income workers. So there is a link between climate and environmental issues. And we see those impacts in our daily lives and in different areas, business, jobs, healthcare. The Global Pact for the Environment was last launched in 2017 to bring together our legally binding international law instruments, Stockholm Declaration, the IUCN World Declaration on the env Environmental Rule of Law, the World Charter for Nature, the Rio Declaration. Can we bring those together in a binding legal document to solidify environmental rule of law around the world and achieve our 2030 agenda for sustainable development? I have a little video here. We'll see if it, if it works. Au cours des 60 dernières années, 40% des guerres civiles ont été liées à la dégradation de l'environnement. Cette année, 20 millions de personnes frappées par des phénomènes météorologiques viendront s'ajouter aux 65 millions de personnes qui ont dû partir de chez elles à cause de conflits et de persécutions. La concrétisation de toutes nos aspirations à la paix, à la prospérité et au développement durable suppose que nous puissions vivre sur une planète saine et féconde. So there's some sobering statistics. And so in light 
of this link between environmental degradation and security. Scholars and scientists have developed the idea of resiliency and expanding the notion of global security. Resilience starts with the belief that humans and nature are strongly coupled, and thus society must include global socio-ecological concerns as human development, which impacts our environment and consumption, derived from consumer sources, pushes us closer to our planetary boundaries. For example, the loss of biodiversity, land use development, and natural resource exploitation, oil and gas, deforestation for palm oil, leads to climate change, drought, and food scarcity, all challenges to peace. Uh, Christina Voigt uh, from Norway in her 2015 article noted environmentally sustainable development and peace. Uh, she noted in that article, a safe, clean, and productive environment is conducive to peace and human security, while environmental stress is both a cause and an effect of political tension and military conflict. The protection and preservation of the natural environment, integrity of ecological systems, and the survival of species are positive to conditions for peace. And she argued for increased international law. We also could engage in litigation. These are the 21 plaintiffs in the Juliana case, all young adults in the United States that sued the United States government for their failure to mitigate climate change. Alas, they lost. Their case was dimiss, dismissed, uh, finding that the courts uh, could not redress this. This was a job for the legislature. In contrast, uh, the Urgenda case in the Netherlands, the court there held that the Dutch government must reduce emissions immediately to be in line with its human rights obligations. We would also might wonder about our individual behavior. Um, I wrote a book called Everyday Environmentalism, where I suggest what you can do in your daily lives to improve the environment. Uh, a few years later, and more recently, my colleague at Pace University, Carl Copeland, wrote this book, Live Sustainably Now. That might be another avenue and makes us wonder what obligations we have as individuals. My research often addresses the ability and role of impact valuation and life cycle costing methodologies in achieving sustainability. When we spend money, when our governments spend money, how do we look beyond all the labels and all the information we see in the supermarket to begin to address all the environmental externalities? And both public law and private law must account for those environmental externalities. Back to Ms. Matai, and I stress this, she argued that industry and global institutions must appreciate that ensuring economic justice, equity, and ecological integrity are of greater value than profits at any cost. And so public law and changing private norms can force realization of these costs, whether by direct regulation, public-private partnerships, or changes to corporate governance norms. Without incorporating these costs into the pricing of activities and, that we engage in and the things that we buy, Ms. Matai's conclusion will be a reality. She said the extreme global inequities and prevailing consumption patterns continue at the expense of the environment and peaceful coexistence. However, given the scope of our security risks, we have to ask of whether these private governance models, whether our changing our own behavior is sufficient or instead grossly inadequate, and whether instead we must embrace and rely upon national and international public governance mechanisms, which as we're seeing in the climate context and now in the pandemic context, are significantly challenged. Finally, as an approach to dealing with these challenges, we can think about returning to the conservation ethic, returning to our basic notions of sustainability. Nothing we have in front of us right now even beats, meets the basic definition of sustainability, where we use it 
it comes back to us. Imagine when we had, you know, very well planned forests that you could cut down a tree stand every hundred years, you had a hundred stands of trees, and then every hundred years you could, you could chop one down. Nothing even is coming close to our basic conceptions of sustainability, and so we need to protect our natural resources and return to a more conservation ethic. So how can we recognize the, important, the enormous nature of the risk in response to these options? This is a picture of, from Australia during their wildfires. I think one argument is that we need an all-hands-on-deck approach, that all the ideas I just suggested we have to pursue. And the challenge is when we recognize a harm in the environment or society matching the proper regulatory tool, the proper action that will actually work in mitigating that harm. Which brings us to coronavirus and COVID-19. Does the response to the pandemic give us any insights about how we might deal with the climate crisis? One is we've seen significant challenges in terms of the global community coming up with a single plan to deal with this problem, just like climate change. Um, I would never in my wild ima imagination would I believe that Sweden and Norway and Finland were having challenges about who can cross the border when and how it's changing every week. Uh, if we can't figure that out, how are we supposed to deal with the, the climate crisis? It makes us wonder if we should begin to rely on state actors, local communities. They will play an increased component in dealing with climate change. And we're already seeing this with a lot of climate cities initiatives. It also forces us to act, ask, what's their relationship and what does it mean for the needs of society? This is an op-ed I recently wrote. It said, society must recognize that both climate change and COVID-19 are sustainability and security crises. The three pillars of sustainability essentially define security without fear of death and illness, without a job, without an income, without the mental health that comes from schooling, open playgrounds, and seeing family and friends, and without clean air and water, one cannot feel secure. And so we're forced to ask, what legal rights should humans demand from leaders in light of these crises, in light of both the climate and COVID crises? And what legal rights should we demand as a result of threats to, the, to our security ourselves, our families, our health, and our livelihoods? Well, we need rights that increase individual, social, and natural stability. What do these include? Universal health care, paid sick leave, unemployment compensation, housing, food, a living wage, a clean and healthy environment, and a properly functioning and sustainable climate system. And the challenge is if we need those in light of these security, how can those be delivered to our communities? Scholars have now noted that one difference between the climate and COVID-19 crisis is that we have moved faster on COVID. We've done things we could have never imagined as a result of this disease. Borders are closed. We're not seeing our elderly grandparents. We're not getting together with friends. Nobody right now is within 12 feet of me, right? Why can't we take such a strong response to an equally severe crisis when it comes to climate change? I started with modern art, thought I'd show some more art um, to show some alternative ways we can bring messaging to our communities. Um, this is art created by a scientist. This shows the annual global temperatures of the Earth from 1850 to 2017, the color scale representing the change in global temperature is covering about 1.35 degrees Celsius. So some final thoughts in the last five minutes I have remaining. First, what does security mean? I think we need a broader conception 
of what security means. It can't just mean military security. It has to include ecological security as well. Second, what about climate justice? Carmen Gonzalez, law professor in the United States, I think has accurately conveyed what we should be thinking about when we think about climate justice. And she argues that racialized communities all over the world have borne the brunt of our carbon capitalism from the cradle, the extraction of fossil fuels, to the grave, which is climate change. Environmental scholars and activists have developed a, a four-part definition uh, that illustrates environmental justice and climate justice concerns. We need to have distributive justice. We need procedural fairness. We need corrective justice. We need social justice. And we're concerned that injustices might occur in all of those things. And climate change is an example of a failure for those justice concerns. Climate change is an example, Carmen Gonzalez writes, of distributive injustice because the global north is responsible for the vast majority of historic greenhouse gas emissions and has reaped the economic benefits, while the people who are disproportionately harmed are the states and the people who have least contributed to the problem. Climate change raises procedural injustice because the North dominates the institutions of global economic and environmental governance and frequently ignores the interests of the global South. Climate change is a manifesta manifestation of corrective injustice because those who bear the, bear the greatest climate change induced harms, including indigenous people, small island states, have been unable to obtain compensation or redress for their injuries. And finally, climate change is linked to broader social justice, including an economic order that systematically exacerbates poverty and inequality while exceeding the limits of the planet's finite resources and subjects our communities of color to slow, what she calls slow violence, resource wars, climate-induced disasters. And I think we're seeing the same situation with COVID-19. Communities of color, communities that have less economic well-being, suffering the brunt of the global pandemic. Olaf Palme said, the Earth's resources are limited and our environment is vulnerable to forces set in motion by technical and economic development. The amounts of air and water are restricted, and so are sources of energy. Supplies of raw materials are exhaustible. Uncontrolled po pollution of the seas and atmosphere may be permanently upset the process on which life depends. The presence of our limited resources is accentuated by population growth. The food production cannot feed the growing number of the world's inhabitants. What is ultimately at stake is the survival of mankind on our limited planet. Pay attention to the words, but also pay attention to the year. 50 years, and we still need to move forward. Lastly, there's lots of great work going on in Stockholm to address these issues of environmental degradation and how they relate to global peace and security. Just as a couple examples, uh, CIPRI, the Stockholm uh, International Peace and Research Institute, has begun their Environment of Peace project, Environment 2020, to raise awareness and see how we might deal with this linkage. Accelerator, the art exhibit at Stockholm University, has a new exhibit coming, and I'll be speaking there in March, uh, where the university's been used to be agricultural fields, and it's been developed, and to think about what is our relationship, what is the relationship of man to nature. And finally, if there's any uh, geeky academics that are watching this, uh, there'll be a very small uh, online workshop which I'm hosting with my colleagues at Pace University and Stockholm University about legal safe cards for justice and security when dealing with the climate crisis, a small workshop of reading papers. And if you're interested in attending that or a day of that, uh, please do reach out to me. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, I've done my best. 
uh, after many months of not having a lot of, of practice giving a lecture this way. So thank you, and I look forward uh, to all of your questions. Thank you very much.